Hello everyone welcome back to the channel. I hope you are having a great day. In today's episode, we are taking a look at the scariest, most bone chilling moments people have ever witnessed in their lives. I was in a car accident. I had looked away from the road to the rear view mirror for a split second. In that split second, the light had changed to red, and the car in front of me hit their brakes far too hard. I cannot accurately describe the terror of looking back out the windshield and realizing I was about to hit them. I don't even remember the impact. One second I'm slamming the brakes, to this day I'm not sure, but I think I might have hit the accelerator instead, and the next I'm dazed, smelling gas, and wondering where my glasses have gone. I was driving a two-door hatch. They were driving an SUV. My car was totaled. They had minor bumper damage. Thankfully, I came out with nothing more than some seriously impressive bruises that left me sore for a few weeks. Less fortunately, I'm pretty thoroughly traumatized. The realization of how quickly something can go wrong haunts me to this day, but I can definitely say I'm a world-class safe driver now. I was at the neighbor's house one night hanging out with her, it was pretty late, maybe 1 to 2 am my husband was at work, and her guy was out with a friend. We suddenly hear someone stomp quickly up the porch steps and try to yank open the storm door, trying to break the latch. It didn't break. It goes quiet, then we hear the person walk off the porch. We're both freaked out. My friend looks through the window and sees a guy walking away out of the yard, so she opens the door to get a better look. I saw him glancing back when she opened the door. He appeared to be taking off. We locked the door and barricaded it with some furniture. But we are still incredibly on edge. Neither of us had a working cell phone at that time. We start to settle down, and when we hear the windows being messed with, the person is going around every window trying to get in. So we turn off the lights and go silent. We make it to her room when we hear the back door being kicked in. She had a baseball bat, and I grabbed a hammer. We were standing in the kitchen close to this door. We yelled at him, and we told him we were on the phone with the cops, even though we were not, that we had a gun and were going to shoot. But this guy didn't stop. He was after us for sure, this was definitely not a robbery, this was going to be a murder. We were seriously scared. I have never been so terrified before or since. We felt trapped in that house, with no way of escape. We knew if we tried to sneak out the front door, this guy would likely get a hold of one of us. He was so close to breaking the door that any second he was getting in, then we can see her boyfriend's headlights through the kitchen window drive up. He saw this guy jump off the back porch and jump the fence, so he jumped out of the car to chase the guy down. But he got away. It really did traumatize me, and it still makes my heart pound to take myself back to that night. About 15 years ago, back when I was in high school, my best friend did tarot card readings. Her readings were usually pretty accurate, and I had a love interest at the time I wanted her to do a reading about. She always made sure that all the cards that belonged in the deck were there, unfortunately for me, she couldn't find the tower card and refused to do the reading until she had a complete deck. I begrudgingly agreed, but as the weeks went by, I started getting impatient and kept bugging her to do the reading, tower card or not. Well, I eventually wore her down and she frustratingly said okay but warned the reading wouldn't be accurate. So I grab her tarot cards and do one final check for the tower card, sure enough, it's nowhere to be found. She goes through them a second time and still has no tower card. So she shuffled the deck a few times, flipped the first card over. It was the tower card. In dead silence, we both just look at each other in complete and utter awe. She says, we're not doing this, and puts the cards away. I agreed completely and never asked for a reading again. I'll never forget that. I was on a backpacking trip for a class in college. It was called outdoor leadership, I majored in recreation and tourism management, yes, it's a field of study. The group had reached our campsite for the night, and everyone was setting up camp and starting to prep their dinners. We had these little single unit gas stoves, typically used for backpacking because of their compact size. I was sitting to the left of the instructor, who was trying to get one lit but was having issues with it. He's fiddling around with the nozzles and the matches, and I hear this very faint hissing sound. Out of the corner of my eye, I suddenly saw a huge ball of flame shoot out, straight at another student who was sitting on the right of the instructor. She went up in flames instantly and started crawling away on her hands and knees, screaming. The flames were flying up her legs and abdomen, and right as it reaches her neck, one of the guys in the group comes leaping over with one of our 10-gallon water supplies, the instructor had had it dropped off earlier that day, knowing where we were going to camp out and he dumps it all over her. He didn't do the trick the first time, so he grabbed the other 10 gallons and finally got all the flames out. She was screaming bloody murder the entire time, and the rest of us were just standing around her with our jaws dropped. The entire scene took less than a minute, 
but it seemed like an eternity. She got the helicopter lifted out of there. She had really bad third-degree burns, but otherwise ended up okay. The image of a person on fire, crawling and screaming, still haunts me. I can't go near those camping burners anymore because of it. I used to be a firefighter up in Alaska. One call we had was a fire in the lower level of a split-level house. You walk in the front door and you either go up or down instead of entering on a floor. The cause of the fire was something like a candle left burning all night and caught the curtains on fire or something like that. I don't really remember, but what scared me the most was that the fire was pretty severe. It had burned its way through the ceiling or floor of the level above us. So as we're on the bottom floor putting water on the fire, the building seemed to fall apart on top of us while myself and two other guys were in there. All of a sudden, we started hearing creaking wood sounds and then crashing as the ceiling came down on top of us. Luckily, we didn't get hurt and made sure to get the fire out as we evacuated from the building. We came back in after the fire was out to do salvage and overhaul of the room or building, and since it had lightened up because the sun was beginning to rise, you could see more stuff inside. When I went back into the building, I looked up through the gaping hole that had been the ceiling and saw that leaning into the hole from the floor above was this massive, absurdly big television on a TV stand or shelf. I think the only thing keeping us from falling is that while we had been on the bottom floor previously, the plug-in cord was stuck on some debris. It was pretty scary realizing I could have been pancakey down there. I was a social worker for DFCS, Department of Family and Children's Services, for six years. It was my dreaded rotation for overnight emergency calls. We had a family that we were already working with, and I had to respond. Dad had gotten drunk again and was threatening everyone. That was a violation of his safety plan. The mom had to leave with the kids, or we would take the kids into care due to her refusal to protect the children from dad. Well, eventually, she agrees to stay with her sister. When sister arrives, they start piling into the car. I had called law enforcement as backup, but they were arriving up the long driveway. I was six months pregnant at the time and was standing by my car as the other car was loading. Out of nowhere, dad freaks out and starts running at me full clip from the porch of the trailer. I jump in my car and lock the door. The police grab him and wrestle him to the ground. It all happened so fast that I don't remember making any decisions or seeing the cops running. As they pull a gun from him, I nope, the fuck out there. We had previously been told there were no firearms. Apparently, there were firearms. Eventually, mom got her life together and left dad. I quit that job after my baby was born and never looked back. At 15-ish, I was at the mall with my parents and a few friends. We were all eating at the foot court, and I decided I'd run to the bathroom. For some reason, the bathroom at the food court of this mall is down a long hallway that's pretty isolated from the rest of the place, and you can't see people from the bathroom door because the hall bends a bit. Well, I do my business and start to leave, but as the bathroom door closes behind me, the men's room a couple feet away opens up, and this old, homeless-looking man comes out and grabs at me. I fought him really hard, but I was a tiny little thing back then, and he started dragging me toward the emergency exit at the far end of the hall. He got me about a foot toward it when another man came out of the men's room and went, hey. The guy drops me and runs out the exit, setting off an alarm, but the guy who yelled chose to help me up and see if I was okay instead of chasing him. I was fine but really roughed up and scared out of my mind, and I ended up crying like a baby in this big, bald, tattooed guy's chest for a good minute until I was calm. For a moment, I really thought I was about to be taken away, and I'll never be able to fully describe the sheer horror I felt at that realization. What was the scariest thing to notice afterward was that he came out the moment I left the bathroom, meaning he was probably waiting for me and just didn't realize there was another man in the men's room. Not witnessed per se, but had this happened to me. Shortly after our father died, my brother, who lives abroad, phoned me to tell me that he was coming over here the following week and he was going to hire a car, and that he and I were going for a drive out to, a remote location that is essentially a dead end in the middle of nowhere, where we were going to have a conversation about my behavior and attitude. He repeated himself about a dozen times, expanding the story with each repetition and ending with a growl do you not agree with me that we need to have this conversation? Each time. I kept saying no, so he'd start up again. I am coming over there next week to have a conversation with you about your behavior and your attitude, addendum to the previous recitation. I could feel that sensation of the blood turning to ice in my veins and the cold hand of fear clutching at my heart and have no doubt whatsoever that had he actually come over here and gotten me into a car. I'd have been murdered in that remote location and my body dumped at the side of the road. This past Saturday night, technically Sunday, early morning, I had been drinking, and I went to bed. I wake up around 3.30am and look at my phone. I see a text from my dad reading please answer. 
I missed his calls about four times, from 1.30 a.m. to around 3. I call him back. Hearing my father begin to cry, my heart sinks. He tells me my younger brother has died. He passed from a heroin overdose. We did everything in our power to get him on the right track. No one is blaming themselves, thankfully. My older brother had found him in the bathroom at my dad's. He was already gone, but the EMTs attempted to revive him. These past few days have gone in slow motion. I'm absolutely exhausted. I'm going to miss my best friend so much. Today is his birthday, he would be 21. I stayed at the Queen and Hotel in San Francisco once, my girlfriend at the time had set up the reservation, I didn't know anything about its history. I woke up in the middle of the night with a ghostly looking woman with rotting flesh, a glowing blue aura, and pitch black, seemingly hollow, eyes standing at the end of the bed staring at me. I was instantly petrified, pulled the sheets over my eyes, and passed back out of fear. I told her about it the next day, and she offered to book a different hotel after laughing hysterically. It turns out she had booked me into the most haunted room of the hotel when I came to visit because she wanted a blind test case to see if it was actually haunted. At that point, I had no choice but to act tough and say I'm going to stick out the week in the hotel, that didn't happen again. Years ago, I worked as a concierge. Mainly second shift, such as 3 to 11. Towards the end of my shift, I was tasked with taking an item to a guest's room. I didn't feel like taking the service elevator all the way in the back, so I went to the main elevator in the lobby. When I got there, there was a lady waiting to go up. I let her go first and told her I would take the next one, there were three elevators. She gets in, and the doors close. I wait for it to go up before I push the button to call the next one, but after a moment, I notice her elevator has never moved. So I push the button anyway, knowing her ride will open to see what's going on. It was bone chilling skin crawling dead empty. The hair on the back of my neck was frozen stiff. I told the front desk I was done for the night and why. The next day, I told some of the housekeepers what had happened. After I described what the ghost looked like, they showed me an old staff photo from about 10 years prior, and there she was. She had been murdered in a robbery about 8 years ago in the gift shop that had since been renovated into a business center. A few of the housekeepers had seen her before late at night walking the halls. I found my fiancé in a chair on the front porch, dead. This was about three and a half days after he mentioned falling off a two-step ladder at work. The next day, he lost consciousness at work and fell again, likely hitting his head on the driveway where he was standing. That evening, he was displaying symptoms of concussion or brain injury, memory loss, loss of balance, no hearing on one side, repeated vomiting, disorientation or confusion, and being severely drowsy. His boss didn't call an ambulance or take him to the ER, and by the time his boss brought him back home, he was refusing treatment, claiming he was fine. He died about 36 hours later, his best guess at the cause of death was a brain hemorrhage. I was the first to find him that morning. My brain, despite knowing what it was seeing, refused to let me accept it right away. I spent a solid few minutes in pure shock, crying hysterically and screaming at him to wake up, before finally coming out of it enough to wake his roommates and get them to call an ambulance, which was almost pointless as he was clearly beyond help. That sight of the man I was supposed to marry and was head over heels for still haunts me almost every night. I have regular nightmares and flashbacks, and I can still remember exactly how he looked or what he was positioned like. This is the story of my dad, a man who worked many jobs, one of which was fixing medical equipment. One day, he got called to a major psychiatric hospital that I will not name for anonymity's sake to deliver some parts. As he was sitting in the waiting room to speak to a representative, a young man in a three-piece suit sat next to him and engaged in conversation. As the discussion advanced, my dad learned that he was an electrician looking for a job at this very hospital. He lamented that he stupidly forgot his tools at home, praying that they wouldn't ask for a demonstration or point out his forgetfulness. My dad, being a sympathetic blue-collar worker, offered to lend him his for the interview. The man was ecstatic, thanking him profusely, and my dad excused himself to get to his car and fetch the tools. At his return, the man was gone, so he asked the receptionist where the electrician that was sitting there before her own return was, he was hazy on the details of where she was beforehand, but it's fair to assume she had business to attend to as well. The receptionist, with a puzzled look, told him that the only other person in that room at her return was a patient who had wandered out of bounds through sheer luck and a bit of cunning but was quickly found out by guards and escorted to his room. She then asked if the electrician my dad was talking about wore a three-piece suit, to which he immediately replied yes and that he brought the tools the man asked for. 
The receptionist turned ghostly white and quietly explained that the electrician was indeed the aforementioned escaped patient and that he and maybe a few others dodged a serious bullet by catching him before he got his hands on those tools, as he was admitted for having brutally mutilated a woman with a pair of scissors. He was renowned amongst the staff as incredibly manipulative and two-faced, one second being a polite gentleman and the next a savage beast with murder as his only intent. He was usually under careful observation, but he managed to slip through by stealing a doctor's suit and credentials in his office. My dad said he never met anyone as nice as that man in his life and has never stepped foot in a psychiatric hospital since. One of the scariest moments of my life was watching a sibling slowly succumb to schizophrenia. They refused to take their medications because they thought they were completely fine and that we were the crazy ones. The talking to themselves when they thought no one could hear was bad, but the progressing to talking to themselves with everyone around them and not thinking it was odd was scary. But for me, the worst was when they started to talk to you in gibberish. I will never forget the moment where they came to me and said, Hey, you ever think the Chinese are watching broccoli because the lungs will inflate and the fields will New York the then not being able to finish whatever the hell they were saying because they broke out into this laughter where snot is flying out of their nose, they are crying and drooling, they are laughing so hard, and you're just standing there looking at them as they are on the floor laughing so hard, and you're like, um, what? I stayed in a hotel in downtown Hamilton. I was traveling alone, female, and about 23 at that time. I was only there for an interview since I was unemployed at the time. It was about 5.30 p.m., so I went out to find a restaurant since I hadn't eaten all day. There was a mall of some sort attached, but everything was closed at that time. I decided to walk down the street near the hotel where most of the restaurants are, and a group of five middle-aged men walked out of a store and surrounded me. It seems like they were on drugs or drunk. They asked me to buy their prescriptions for them. I told them I didn't have any money to buy it for them. They told me that I should be able to afford at least one of theirs, and they would make it up to me. I said again that I don't have money to pay for it. I'll never forget the look in their eyes. They started to get angry and shout at me when I tried to walk away, but they blocked me and started to get more aggressive by the minute. People walked by as this was happening, and I tried to talk to them, but they ignored it and walked away with their heads down. I knew I had to handle this myself at that point. So I decided to just fuck it. I pushed past them and went into the nearest well-lit place possible. I'm surprised they didn't grab me while I pushed through them, but they followed me and shouted at me until I went into the nearest restaurant. They stayed outside and stared at me for what seemed like hours. I told the restaurant owners what happened. And they told me it's a common thing that happens. I chose a seat that was facing away from the window and stayed there for about two hours. I never looked back out the window. Before I left, I checked to see if they were still standing there. Thankfully, they weren't. I hightailed it back to the hotel while avoiding that area as much as possible. I never went down that street again, and I avoided that area unless I was with a friend. Thinking back on it, I should have called the police once I was in a safe place. Now I carry a knife in my purse when I go out alone. And for those wondering, I didn't accept the job there. Earlier this year, I was driving home from work a little after 8 p.m. on a major highway that runs along the downtown of the city I work in. It was any other Tuesday, the one day of the week I work late, and I was almost downtown, riding in the left lane going the speed limit, 50 miles per hour, minding my own business. I didn't see anything initially. To this day, even having relived the accident in therapy, I know I never saw the car. The only warning I got was the sound of tires screeching. At the time and even now, the moment slows down, and I could swear it dragged on forever before anything else happened. The truth is that I didn't even have time to look or to check my mirrors before I was struck from the right and pinned against the barricade to my left. Then I flipped. I can't imagine why, the car must have come up under me because its center of gravity was so much lower. I rolled to the right and ended up skidding down the highway on my roof. To this day, I have no idea what I was doing with my hands and feet or if I was totally silent or screaming. But what is burned permanently into my mind is the visual. First, the windshield and roof in front of me started to shatter and cave in, respectively. That was when I first rolled. As I was skidding, I calmly watched the lights on my dash roll from one side to the other, then surge and go dead. There were three distinct points when I thought I was going to die. One, when I hit the wall I was scared in an extremely feral, fight or flight sense. It was this animalistic feeling where nothing else existed but survival. There was obviously nothing I could do, and in fact, if I was flailing at the steering wheel, which is likely, I may have made things worse. 2. When I rolled I was starting to gain more clarity at this point, but my mind was still racing. As soon as I stopped rolling, I remember thinking, okay, I'm alive. I'll be alright. 
that was before I realized that while I'd stopped moving on one axis, I was still moving on another. 3. While skidding. I was completely calm at this point. I watched the aforementioned dashboard lights rolling and dying and thought, this is probably it right here. Then I reflected on how long I'd been skidding because it felt like a really long time, and I patiently waited to be struck by another vehicle because that's what I fully expected to happen. Instead, I finally came to a stop, felt all my limbs, and realized that I was probably safe now, even though I was still worried that another vehicle might hit me. Then I heard the other driver. He ran up to my car in tears, asking me if I was okay, and helped me crawl out of my front passenger side window. I sat on the pavement next to the car, laughed, and with blood running down the side of my face, I stood up, pointed at the car upside down in the middle of the highway, illuminated by the glow of three lanes of traffic stopped a hundred feet or so behind, and said, look at this. I thought I was done. He let me use his phone to call my wife, and she left work to rush over. My mother-in-law, daughter, and stepson all tried to get to me as well, but the highway was totally shut down. They ended up following my ambulance instead. I had a polite conversation with my EMT on the way to the hospital. I'm an EMT as well, and she was almost brand new, so I wanted her to be at ease. She did a good job. So far, I have successfully been one of those guys who almost eats it and somehow shrugs it off with a laugh. I got to the hospital, had x-rays and CTs, and nothing was broken, so they gave me a hydrocodone and sent me home. I texted my boss with a picture of the accident and said, I don't think I'll be in tomorrow. Then I got in the shower, picked the glass out of my scalp, and cried like a baby. When we went to look at the car the next day, the guy at the wrecker service said that based on the wear on the roof, I must have skidded one quarter to half of a mile. It turns out that the other driver was using his phone map. He looked up at the last moment and tried to lane change but lost control, and that's why he hit me from the right side. He and another guy helped me find my phone, which was lying in the middle of the highway after flying out the window. The case was scratched, but it was otherwise perfect. Also, the insurance company counted off the vehicle's appraisal for the bloodstains on the roof's interior. When I was in junior high school, there was a kid who lived two doors down from me. His name was Eric. On July 4th, Eric got hold of some M80 firecrackers. They were huge. He only had a couple of them, and they'd cost him a couple of weeks allowance, so lighting privileges went to him. The very first one blew his thumb right off his hand. I was like, maybe 12? 13? And there I was, looking at my friend, looking at his hand in disbelief as blood sprayed everywhere. He grabbed it, screamed, and ran around. Some other kids scattered, proper response at that age, shit happens and you do not want to be around to get in trouble, so you get out quick without asking questions or trying to gauge the extent of the damage. I ran into the house and got his mom. She took charge, stopped the bleeding, and took him to the hospital. He came back a few days later with his thumb and most of the heel of his palm missing. A strange epilogue, the story of the crow who cried Eric. Those days, we didn't have cell phones, and kids were allowed to play outside until well after dark in the summertime. When your parents needed you, they stood on the back steps of their houses and yelled your name at the top of their lungs, and woe betide the kid who didn't come running. There was this crow who had made his, or maybe her, I'm no ornithologist, nest above the family's garage. Now, Eric was a bit of a rover, so every day the crow got to hear Eric's mom yell Eric. Eric. Over and over dozens of times. She'd yell Eric. Eric. When it was time for him to come home for lunch, then again when his dad got home from work, then when it was time for dinner, time for bed. And so eventually the crow somehow learned to yell Eric. Eric. Just like that, always twice and always in the same tone or tenor as the mom had done. It was annoying. He'd do that all fucking day. Sometimes we'd throw rocks at the crow, but I think it just amused him. The rock would was by, and he'd yell Eric. Eric. Again. Well, after getting his hand blown to bits by an M80 firecracker, Eric wasn't much in the mood to play outside anymore. We rarely saw him. The family had issues too, not the least of which was how the police felt about parents allowing their kids to play with dangerous ordinances. And so, at the end of that fall semester at school, they moved away. But they didn't take the crow with them. I lived in my house, two doors away, for another six years. And every summer, that damn crow would spend the entire day yelling Eric. Eric. From the top of that garage. Forty years later, I still expect to hear Eric. Eric. When I step outside on a warm summer evening.